Good evening to you all, and uh, uh, I'll finish. I'll start and finish with the same phrases. Congratulations to all the prize recipients tonight, and also congratulations to their supportive family and friends who are here as well. Uh, you don't do this sort of thing alone, and support is often unacknowledged. Uh, when I was asked to come and speak uh, at the law school's uh, prize giving evening, I jumped at the chance. Uh, then I sat down to actually write down what I was going to say. And I thought, what do you say to an audience of exceptionally high achievers? I can't really urge you to success because you're already there. Uh, so I thought, what else can I tell you about? What can I offer you? And I guess what I thought I can offer the students here, who will be at different stages of their degrees, I thought I could offer you uh, an insight into how uh, an original and rather unorthodox thinker uh, worked his way through this law school uh, in the mid-90s, uh, and actually how he used his law degree uh, in the world of high entertainment. Uh, so please bear with me. Uh, I have a few anecdotes. Uh, names will be named, uh, and hopefully by the end of it I'll have inspired you in, in some small way. Uh, but I thought the best thing I could do to a room full of high achieving law students, uh, I don't know if you offer a defamation as a course or maybe media law or something similar, uh, I could call upon the person winning that prize, but uh, I've got a legal problem for you. Uh, there are two questions. Is the person named defamed? And if so, should the person named pursue legal action for defamation? This is a book review. It's about my book, Contest. And the reviewer says, in his introduction to Contest, author Matthew Riley promises a non-stop rollercoaster ride on paper. He's right on this point because the reader can fly through the book in a couple of lengthy sessions. Largely, that's because Riley writes such lightweight adventure crap <laughs> that there's no point sitting back, taking it easy, and letting the finer points of his appalling writing flow. <laughs> OK, remember, is the person named defamed? <laughs> Should they take action? This is another book review. This is not a review of one of my books. This was a review of a book called Underground by Andrew McGahn. And in the review, uh, this was a Sydney Morning Herald review. Curiously, Mr. McGahn pursues his agenda in the unlikely form of a fast-moving and sometimes outrageous action-adventure novel, parts of which read as if Matthew Riley had suddenly and miraculously discovered how to write competent prose. <laughs> We, we will come back to the question, <laughs> and I'll take answers from the audience. Uh, as you know, I write great big action-adventure novels. Uh, the books are sold around the world, and as you can see in the program, I've sold the movie rights uh, to Hover Car Racer, uh, to Walt Disney Pictures. Uh, I've written screenplays for Hollywood films. I sold a television script uh, to Sony and ABC uh, Network in the States a couple of years ago. Uh, lest you think I solely live in the world of just mass market entertainment, I did fund uh, the completion of a low-budget Australian film about Vietnamese asylum seekers uh, coming to Australia by boat called Mother Fish by a wonderful Australian director named Qua Do. Uh, I also sit on a federal government committee called the Public Lending Right and the Educational Lending Right. And some of the academics here will probably receive a cheque uh, in the next month uh, from me. Uh, because we give money to Australian authors, both fiction and academic, for having their books in lending libraries. Um, I'll talk about it a little later, but my legal education helped me an awful amount in that. But believe it or not, the bedrock of my entertainment fiction career really was laid here at the University of New South Wales Law School. Uh, because, and I I kid you not, my law degree to this day remains the very best thing I ever did, uh, even though I never, ever got a practicing certificate. Um, I've actually been a professional novelist since I graduated from this law school. So this speech will be in, in a few parts. Uh, I'll lay out the facts, I'll identify the applicable law, and then I'll apply the applicable law to the facts. Uh, no, no. In, in, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to relate to you some of my experiences uh, at the law school. I did not attend uh, the law school in this building. I was in the uh, library tower back in the dark ages of the mid-90s. 
Uh, but I'll tell you about my experiences and how I applied them to my life in the world of entertainment uh, as a novelist and a screenwriter. Uh, hopefully you'll get some inspiration, maybe you won't, there are no guarantees in life. Uh, my credentials, uh, I studied here between 1993 and 1997. Uh, I came 31st out of 250 students, which means I came about at the 12% mark. Uh, I had a distinction average for my studies, and now I know in present company that probably sounds kind of quaint. Uh, <laughs> But in my first year of law school, I wrote my first novel, Contest. Uh, and in my final year of law school, I wrote my second novel, Ice Station, uh, which catapulted me to global fame as a novelist. So I think we'll call it even uh, <laughs> on that stake. Uh, uh, during my time at law school, I, I wrote some short pieces and I made a few short films. Uh, I wrote for Poetic Justice, uh, writing a column called De Minimis. Uh, in which I once called the then Dean Paul Redman, uh, part snake oil salesman and part snake. Uh, those were hitting, you know when you're a student you're really fired up. While a debater at school, uh, I actually only did one witness examination and never really got into mooting. Uh, apologies to the mooters out there, but I always thought one side just got the better part of the argument. Um, some of my experiences, and I was very fortunate in the teachers I had at my time here at UNSW. I had Dennis Harley for contracts. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell the Harley students. Uh, when I got into law school, I managed to have a conversation with a partner at Phillips, Phillips Fox. And I said to him, if there's one thing I should do well at law school, what should I do well? And he said, do contracts well. Life is contracts. And I've, as I've discovered in the world of entertainment, he was absolutely right. And of course, I had Dennis Harley as my contracts teacher. And Dennis was a great, and I believe he's still here, is still a great teacher. Uh, he's often fashionably late for class. I don't know if that still goes on. <laughs> but I, there's one thing I recall about studying with Dennis. I actually went to see Dennis after a particular contracts class. I, like probably many of you, always did the reading. And when Dennis would ask a question in class about the assigned reading, he would look around the class, there would be heads bowing, people ducking for cover, and I would sort of, you know, process of elimination, put up my hand. And it got to the point where I was answering questions so often, he would call me Riley QC. Uh, by the end of the year, I'd actually graduated to Riley J, uh, which some of my fellow students addressed me as in the hallways. Uh, but I went to see Dennis after a class because I said to him, I I'm worried that I might be monopolising the class time, answering the questions. Shouldn't other students be answering the questions? And Dennis, in, in that big booming voice that he has, said, don't let it bother you, son. If they don't want to learn, so be it. You learn as much as you can. And so from then on, I didn't worry about it. If Dennis called on me because no one else was going to answer, I answered. And I made sure I did advanced contracts because life is contracts, especially the entertainment world. I did tax law under Phil Burgess. If any of you plan to earn millions of dollars in your life, do tax law with Phil Burgess. Expect quotes from Goldfinger, though. Uh, what is it? Once Mr. Bond is happenstance, twice is coincidence, three times is enemy action. He said this in class. The whole group of accountancy students in my class just stared at him. I swear one of them almost put up his hand and said, is this going to be on the exam? <laughs> I, um, I alone laughed out loud. I actually recall doing a tax essay. It was on the GST. And uh, there's Phil's handwriting on the last page. And this, this is my gift as a writer. He wrote in ha handwriting on the last page, I'm not sure if this essay is more style over substance. Oh, what the hell, 85. <laughs> Who says tax law is boring? Uh, in criminal law under Sandra Egger, uh, in the first class of criminal law, Sandra informed the class that there are no criminal masterminds in real life. Uh, this has turned out to be true. Uh, one of the greatest experiences I had at law school, and I encourage non-law students to do it, is the criminal law requirement to go to the Downing Centre and sit in on actual criminal cases in the magistrate's courts and see the lowest level of our legal system in action. I will never forget going to the Downing Centre and seeing a fellow front up to the chief magistrate. He'd stolen a Porsche. And the chief magistrate said to him, why'd you steal the car? And he'd never driven a Porsche before. 
and the magistrate said, well, I've never driven a Porsche before, but it doesn't mean I can go and steal somebody's Porsche. I understand that your pride and joy is your V8 Holden Commodore. And I said, yes, Your Honour. He said, I'm going to fine you $2,000 for stealing the Porsche. And if you can't pay it, I'm going to make you sell your V8 Commodore. And it was a wonderful thing to see. And I, I actually encourage non-law students to go down to the Downing Centre and see our courts in action. I also, and I'm sure this is applicable to many of you, did a summer clerkship uh, over the summer of 1996-1997. Um, now, as I said, my, my marks were pretty good, so I got a lot of clerkship interviews. But I only got one clerkship offer, and that was from Cause Chambers Westgarth. Now, there's maybe a reason for me only getting one offer. It might have been all the creative stuff on my resume, the short films, the written pieces of work. I actually did have an interview with Allens, and I had a very nice partner in the interview, but I also had this sort of young gun solicitor there. And uh, we had a really great interview. I thought it went really, really well. And then the young solicitor leans forward and goes, Matthew, I've just got one problem with you. What? He said, I don't think you want to be a lawyer. <laughs> and of course, at the time, I said, no, of course I want to be a lawyer. Of course I do. <laughs> But the bastard was right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, a, that's not to say that Cause Chambers Westgarth got the booby prize. Cause took me on, and I had a wonderful time that summer at Cause Chambers Westgarth, and I still think it's a magnificent law firm. One of the interesting things that a partner at Cause named Andrew Price got me to do, he saw the creative stuff on my resume. And he, he, quickly, he quickly selected me and brought me up to the property section. And he handed me a 144-page construction contract. He says, Matthew, we build hotels. And this is the contract we use. But if we get disputes on the site, you know, variations, whatever, they have to go to the contract. Now, 144-page contract is pretty thick. And he says, the, the guys on the site don't really know how to read a contract. Can you draw the contract as a flowchart uh, for them to use on the sites. And so I worked in the property division of Cause Chambers Westgarth, and I did it for this client, and I drew the contract. So if you have a, disp a dispute, you go here. If yes, you go here. If no, down here. If this goes to yes, go here. If there's another no, you go back to square one. Uh, I did it for the first client. Andrew loved it. He said, go back, delete all the client references, and we'll just put, you know, A and B, and I'll keep selling it for $5,000 a pop every time we build a new hotel. <laughs> he, was a, he was a very shrewd man. Uh, and, uh, and actually, I, I had the dubious distinction, or maybe the, the great distinction, that uh, after I left university and uh, became a novelist, I needed to get some corporate entity work done. And so I called uh, one of my favourite associates at, at Cause Chambers Westgarth. So in the space of a year, I went from being a clerk to being a client at Cause. What I would like to say, and I was talking to one of your um, final year students before I, just as I was arriving, some of the options you have as a, a law graduate, there may be more options than you think. That often we, we see our graduates going to summer clerkships and trying to get graduate offers, and we think that a, a city law firm is the only choice available. And I've had several friends go through this and other law schools. Uh, I had one. Uh, who has gone through the city law firm system and has risen to be a partner at, at Deakins. Uh, he's a very steady, unflashy type, and the law firm progression suited him immensely, and he has risen up through the ranks quite happily. I had another friend go to New York City, uh, started here at Freehills and went to New York to work for the law firm Millbank. Um, the work there was dull, the conditions were nice, but the hours were long and Dickensian and the supervision by the partners was almost non-existent. Uh, this friend, funnily enough, created collateralised debt obligations uh, and giant $100 million deals. Then in 2008, when the global financial crisis hit, uh, the foreign-born late-entry lawyers were the first ones fired. Uh, that friend of mine came home from New York City. A third, who graduated with me from this law school, is now a law lecturer full-time at the University of Western Sydney named Simon Kozlina where he is much loved by his students. Uh, he didn't like the city law firm life, but loves teaching law. Uh, he is a gun contracts teacher. And while I never saw an actual contract in any of Dennis Harley's contracts classes, if you do Simon's class at the University of Western Sydney, 
On the first day, he pulls out the Apple iTunes uh, terms and conditions, and he also pulls out your Telstra contract and generally gets gasps of horror. And of course, there's someone like me. Uh, I wrote my first book in my first year here, self-published it during my summer clerkship at the wonderful Cause Chambers Westgast. Many people at Cause bought original copies of Contest, which now sell for about $2,000 each, so good for Cause Chambers Westgast. <laughs> uh, I Station was the book which shot me around the world, and, and the books have sold very well. Interestingly, movie deals. Now, remember, life is contracts, and movie contracts put hotel construction contracts to shame in complexity. Some of the most, in and my legal education has meant that I am the only guy in Hollywood who actually reads my Hollywood movie contracts. Uh, for one of the movie deals on the books, I had to warrant and affirm that the work in my book was my original work throughout the universe. <laughs> I couldn't guarantee it, but I signed it anyway. One of the other famous things in Hollywood is the, the term net profits. Uh, net profits is where you obviously take away the costs of the movie from the box office earned. And according to Warner Brothers, the Lord of the Rings has never made a net profit. My contract for, for Hover Car Racer uh, is, is written in English. The definition of net profits is a whole page long. And I think it is two sentences over the course of that whole page. It is the only clause in a contract I have read, and I read English, that I have never understood. <laughs> but I signed that anyway too. <laughs> uh, uh, with my work on the Federal Government Committee, the, the Public Lending Right, uh, I've done some really unusual things. And again, the legal education I had here came into force. I've drafted legislation uh, and sent it off to the Office of Legal Drafting, and only someone who's read legislation, and a lot of it, can actually give that a go with confidence. Unexpectedly, I've been called upon on occasion to be a judge. That sometimes when it comes to, to giving out millions of dollars of federal government money, you get conflicting claims. And I turn up to a committee meeting and there might be an author and an editor who are both claiming the money for a certain book or work. And it's fallen to me to be the one who's had to judge. And fortunately, having five years experience of reading legal judgments has put me in good stead for that. And it leads me to, to possibly the main point that I would give to, you, to the students here today. And it's, it's to inform you, despite the fact that you clearly know everything, it's to inform you of maybe one of the lesser known things that you will learn as part of your legal education. What you will learn is how to make decisions. I make decisions every day of my creative working life. And when you argue a case in court or whether you argue a case on one of your assignments, you have to take the choice and decide if the plaintiff or the defendant is going to prevail and you have to run with it. And I'll never forget one of the property law questions that I had and a friend of mine, we went off to do our assignments, we handed in the assignments separately. I said, what did you do? Did you find for the applicant or the respondent? He said, oh, it was the applicant. I said, well, I found for the respondent. Got our papers back, we both got the same mark. You have to make your decision and you have to run with it. And when I had to make those judgments under this federal government committee that I'm on, I had to make a decision. And actually the thing that I called upon was going to the Downing Centre and seeing that magistrate in action. So after all that, uh, what can you learn from me? Do contracts well. If you're not already doing it, if you're not already enrolled for advanced contracts, advanced contracts. If you want to earn millions, tax law, Phil Burgess, Goldfinger, James Bond. More seriously, understand that the prize that you win and you get you receive tonight is not the end. The, the prize that you get tonight is actually the beginning. It is the beginning. It is a recognition of learning well done. But that's not the end goal. The end goal is to take what you learn here and take it out into the real world and do something, hopefully, something good with it. Uh, but as I have said, uh, you don't have to go through the traditional legal world to do that. So to go back to the very, very start, uh, was the person defamed by those reviews? Who got the media law prize? <laughs> was the person defamed? I say no. No? <laughs>
ba bong. <laughs> I reckon yes, uh, at least in the second one. If yes, should he sue? Well, depends how far I answer. Yeah, I guess so. Hmm. <laughs> I, uh, I actually consulted my friend of mine uh, who's become a partner and he brought in one of the best defamation lawyers in the country and he said I should sue. I decided I shouldn't. I think it's a very bad idea for an author to sue a newspaper. I'm going to sell lots of books later in my life but if I sue the Sydney Morning Herald once I'm pretty sure I'll never appear in the Sydney Morning Herald ever again. <laughs> so sometimes the legal answer has to be tempered with a commercial answer. So I shall leave you there and finish the way I started and say congratulations to the prize recipients and my congratulations to their families and supporters. Thank you very much.